Hey everybody and welcome to another JASP tutorial. In this tutorial, we are going to talk about the individual power analysis functions in the power module. So in this episode, we're going to talk about the independent samples t-test, which I kind of went over in the overview of this module video. Check that video out. Um, there's probably a card that just pulled, popped up into the top right corner of the, the video if you're not watching this on TV. And you can watch that and that's the overview of the whole module. In this video, we're just going to talk about the specific things that you need to do to use this module to do your power analysis. And, and for each of these subsequent videos, it's just going to be on a single test and we'll go through each of the different kinds of power analysis for that test. Before we get started, I just want to mention that there was a hot fix that was uh, released a few days ago on the uh, 29th of May. Um, and this, this video is probably two weeks or three weeks out from, from that. So if you haven't updated your uh, JASP yet, I do suggest that there were several errors that um, were fixed uh, in this in this point one update here. Quality control module was broken. The repeated measures ANOVA was failing because of a missing package. Uh, the reliability module was failing because of a missing package. Uh, the read, uh, update to read stat 1.1.9 to fix local character encoding issues. And then filtering and custom contrasts resulted in an error. So a lot of hot fixes, a lot of missing packages. So they added those in. So if you need to do uh, repeated measures ANOVA or contrasts in the ANOVA or reliability, or you do QC stuff, I definitely recommend updating. All right, so let's talk about the independent samples T power test, okay? So we're doing the power module. And of course, when you click on power, it comes directly to the independent samples T test. That's by default. And so in my overview video, I pretty much didn't change any of this stuff. We were talking about 86 and everything, and we were going through all of the output. But what I want to do now is actually go through the particulars of this module for independent samples t-tests. Okay, so independent samples t-tests are what you do to test the difference between two independently measured groups on a single variable. So you have the experiment or the control condition, you have group one and group two, whatever it is, these are two independent samples and you want to see whether or not there is a difference between the two means. That's all it is that we're doing. Now the power module in JASP by default wants you to do an a priori power analysis. That's what it says here, a priori. In a priori, for um, you non-Latin speakers is beforehand, it's essentially before I go and think. So uh, a priori, ergo, so before, therefore, you know, something like that. I'm not the best at Latin, but anyways, a priori. So that's before. So when you do an a priori power analysis, you are looking for your sample size. OK, so we're doing I, I'm not obviously going to change the test in other videos. I'm going to be doing um, the rest of these. And so what we're going to do is an a priori power analysis. And I'm just going to change some of these parameters. So you can see what changes over here. Uh, so it's just not all static because I've left everything the same. So let, let's not worry about that. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to do the data generation. Uh, we're, we're just going to do this module up here. We're going to leave the plots. You can explore again what the plots and the data generation are showing uh, in the previous video. This is just going to be tight to parameters. So I'm actually going to close these two. So we're not looking at them. Okay. So we're going to do an a priori power analysis. How many people do we need to measure to achieve a specific or range, I suppose, or or uh, idea uh, of a, an effect size with two pieces of information that go into power, okay, or or go into sample size. So the relationship is between four four ideas, and if you know three of these uh, concepts, values, ideas, if you know three of these, then you can find the fourth. So if we're looking for sample size, then we need to know what effect size we're looking for. We need to know what our power is, or, or our desired power. And that's minimal here. And then the type one error rate that we plan to use. Now, the interesting thing about this is you don't really need to change much about any of this. And then the final thing is whether or not you want equal groups. And so we're just going to do that. We're just going to leave it as as one. But I'll go through that. So let's talk about these three things right off the bat. We're going to leave alpha at 0.05. And I don't think you need to change alpha at all. Uh, 0.05 is has been standard for decades now, and there's no real reason to change it unless you're going lower to 0.01. But even in that case, I don't recommend changing it. OK, now, the other th ones that we want to change are our effect size of interest uh, identified here as the absolute value of uh, delta, lowercase delta, which is uh, a parameter uh, value or parameter symbol for Cohen's D, which is a Latin letter D, right? So it's really Cohen's difference, right? That's what the D stands for, difference between the means on a standard deviation scale. So we're looking for the absolute value of that. And the reason I think the reason why uh, delta was used here is because it matches with beta and alpha. So we might as well, right? So that is the minimal effect size of interest. So when you're looking for a sample size, you want to put the smallest value in this box for Cohen's D on an independent sample t-test that makes sense. Okay, so 0.5 is put in here because in Cohen's original conventions, 
it, he says that 0.2 is a small effect, 0.5 is a medium effect, and 0.8 is a large effect. Now, to rephrase those, 0.5 is a half a standard deviation. So that means that the two means are half a standard deviation apart. So 0.2 is they're, they're really, really close, right? We're only about a quarter standard deviation, a little less than a quarter standard deviation. And then 0.8 is a little bit more than three quarter standard deviation, right? So that's what you're kind of looking for. Now, where do I find this information? Where do I find this information? Well, you can either just think that you want to find the smallest effect that is reasonable, okay, uh, from your reading of the literature. What do most effect sizes look like? Uh, with the variables that you plan to use. Um, maybe you have no idea. Maybe that there you've been reading some old stuff and they have no effect size listed. And so you kind of have to figure it out. You're like, oh, how many do I need? So what we're going to do is we're just going to change this to point two because I think that rec uh, recognizes that, man, we don't know what we don't know, what we need for this particular sample, okay, for this particular study. So we're going to go with small effect. None of the research that I've been reading is telling me effect sizes. So I'm just going to look for a very small effect, uh, not a very small effect, just a small effect. I could change that to point 0.1 if I wanted to. But as you'll see, if we do that, the, I mean, the amount of participants that we need is going to change dramatically. Okay, so that's delta. We're going to go with a point 0.2, okay? Uh, well, Cohen's D. We're going to go with a point 0.2, okay? Small effect. Now, the next one is minimum desired power. One minus beta, okay? So one minus beta is power. That, that, that idea there. And so what is beta? Beta is the probability of making a type 2 error. Now, a type 2 error is saying that there is no effect when the effect actually exists in reality. Type 1 is the opposite of that. Okay, so type 2 is how big do we want the probability of this error to actually be? In a lot of conventional wisdom over the last couple of decades has been 0.8 for power or 0.2 for, you know, a type 2 error probability. I'm going to miss a 20% uh, chance that I miss the effect. Now, by default, as you can see here, JASP puts in 0 0.9, 0 0.9. The interesting thing about it is that G Power, which is the power analysis standard app, which has a, a whole host of even more functions than, than any of these tests, right? A lot more, a lot more, right? Um, 0.95 is the default value that they put in G Power. So, so is, you know, what do we got here? Uh, and a 0.9 is fine. I'm just going to do what I teach, which is 0.8. And the reason why I use 0.8 as my teaching is because you'll find it in most textbooks. But also, um, for my students, they're already staring down the barrel of a situation where their sample sizes are probably not going to be big enough regardless because we are at a small school and they have limited time to collect that data. And only and I, I force them with these projects, with these with these research projects, to only use the students at my institution. So they already have a small pot, and there's no reason for me to artificially inflate that pot uh, that they have to that they have to draw from um, by by using um, you know 0.9 or 0.95. So I always tell them to put in 0.8. Your power requirements are your own power requirements. It's only one thing to change. So you know I just want to show you what what happens when this changes. Okay, now. The interesting thing was, is when I clicked away from 0.2 and I changed it to 0.8, you saw it update. So before we click away for needing 0.9 power right here, you can see how many more people I need in my study to achieve 0.9 power. 527 per group. 527 per group. That's over 1,000 people. What's 1,054 or something like that? Uh, 1,054. 527 per group just in the two ways, just, just by changing the effect size that I was looking for. Right. This is why power analyses are really, really important. Now, let's click away from minimal desired power and see what happens to this. Pay attention here as we click away. Look at that. Only three hundred and ninety four. Now, I was expecting this number because my students recently did their power analyses a few months ago at the beginning of you know the beginning of the this past semester in January of this year. So I was expecting three hundred and ninety four for these parameters. And the reason why I was expecting that is because many of them had uh, difficulty finding um, the effect size in the literature or they couldn't find it or effect sizes weren't uh, uh, reported. And so. They had to do these, the exact power analyses that I'm doing with you right now. So 394, 394 per group, or, you know, just under 800, 788. Yeah, 788. So that number is also familiar to me, right? So, and our actual power, if we get 394 per group, should be, a, should be just over our minimal target. So that's good, right? And that's what the calculation is doing. It is saying that um, we are going to find one minus beta as close as possible to your target, but choosing a obviously an even number because we have two groups choosing an even number so we can divide it so we can divide it evenly. Um, and so how many is that? So if we had 393 here and 393 here, our a power would be less than 0.80. And so we need to add an extra person per group so you can achieve 
something at least 0 0.80 okay and then we have our parameters here and the great thing about this module is it gives you some visualizations about how uh this would this would work out okay and um you can see here that our desired point is at the demarcation between this green and this yellow green right here that's where we would be okay for this hypothetical effect size and you can see here a breakdown about uh, what would happen is if, if the true effect size was actually smaller than we uh indicated then we are likely going to miss it okay if it's just slightly smaller, then we might be able to uh, detect it, but good chance of missing. And then uh, if it's between 0.2 and 0.257, then we have are going to have a probable, probable detection. So this is a, a great little uh, breakdown of what you're looking for. Now, let's do the other two effect sizes before this video gets too long. OK, the other power analyses. So that's for finding sample size. OK, now, if you want to leave this up here, you would just duplicate this analysis. So we're going to duplicate this analysis and do copy of we're going to do copy of power. And the funny thing is that when I duplicate it again, it'll be copy of copy of power. OK, so let's do let's do what is called a post hoc power analysis, which is doesn't change. That's a slightly frustrating. This would be a not a a priori power analysis this would be a post hoc power analysis. OK, so let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. All right. So now we have a, an effect size of interest. We are not detecting power. OK. We are going to put in our type one error rate, which we're probably going to leave at 0.05. But now we have sample size per group. OK, what was our sample size per group? Hmm. Well, if we leave everything like this, then you can see our power is 0.095. All right. Let's just say that we're going to follow this and we're going to go. OK, well, we're trying to get 0.8 power, but let's see what happens if we only get 300 people per group. And I'm, I'm purposefully on the wrong results. So it can be a surprise. So it's going to run that calculation. Let's slowly scroll. Let's slowly scroll Oh, There we go. So 300 people per group. We would get a power of 0 0.686, 0 0.686. So that is between this good chance of missing. So what would happen is we would need an, an actual effect size of greater than 0 0.229 for us to be able to uh, detect the effect okay, of 0.2. Okay? So that's a power, 0 0.686. A design with a sample size of 300 in each group can detect sizes of D greater or equal to 0 0.2 with a probability of at least 0.686, assuming a two-sided criterion for detecting that allows for a maximum type 1 error of alpha 0.05. Okay, that's how you would do that. By the way, I haven't been changing the alternative hypothesis to one-sided because that um, is not a test you should really do. Uh, when you're doing a t-test, uh, it is much more conservative and appropriate to use a two-sided test. So always do your power analyses as two-sided. That's all I'm going to say on that one. Okay, so that is how um, that power works here. Okay. Power hypothetical effect size, that's where we find ourselves at 0.686. So that is how you, this is called a post hoc power analysis because you already collected the data. You've already found that your Cohen's D is 0.2, right? So how much power did you end up with? When you do, uh, so, so if you're a, an SPSS user or have come from SPSS, when you do a power analysis in SPSS, it only gives you observed power. When you ask for power in the, um, in, I don't know, it's been so long since I've used SPSS. Uh, there, I know that there is an observed power option that you can select, and, and, it, and it makes it uh, a lot easier to um, to do, to use, you know. All right, so that is the, I want to calculate power. Now, the last one is, I want to calculate, let's close this, copy of copy of power, I told you. I want to calculate the effect size. <clears throat> now, this is only for independent samples d-tests, remember? So we're uh, calculating Cohen's D, okay? Now, if I don't change anything in our previous example, 300, right? We have a, a, a Cohen's D of 0.229, okay? 0.229, minimum desired power is 0.8. Now, what effect size do I get? Now, let's see what happens when I put in 394, because synergy is how we do things here, right? It still calls this the a priori power analysis. That's not accurate, okay? You're just calculating your effect size, okay? Let's click away from it. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, look at that. It went down. So we've got 394, which was our first one, right? 0 0.2. Look at that. It changed, obviously. <laughs> so power 0 0.8, 394, 394. Look at that. We've got our 0 0.20, which was what we wanted for in the beginning, right? Pretty amazing. So that's how, so that's how these three ideas work for determining your either your sample size, your post hoc power after you've measured everything or after you've measured everything, your effect size. So it's a little effect size calculator as well. If you know your power, you know your sample size and everything else, you'll be golden. And that's how you use the power module in JASP for an independent samples t-test. I obviously I recommend doing the a priori power analysis before you start collecting data. If you have any comments, questions, suggestion or other feedback, please leave those in the comments down below. Thank you for watching this video. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.